The Secret Agent by Joseph Conrad Audibook. Chapter 8 Having infused by persistent importunities some sort of heat into the chilly interest of several licensed victuallers the acquaintances once upon a time of her late unlucky husband, Mrs. Verloc's mother had at last secured her admission to certain almshouses founded by a wealthy innkeeper for the destitute widows of the trade. This end, conceived in the astuteness of her uneasy heart, the old woman had pursued with secrecy and determination. That was the time when her daughter Winnie could not help passing a remark to Mr. Verloc that mother has been spending half-crowns and five shillings almost every day this last week in cab fares, but the remark was not made grudgingly. Winnie respected her mother's infirmities. She was only a little surprised at this sudden mania for locomotion. Mr. Verloc, who was sufficiently magnificent in his way, had grunted the remark impatiently aside as interfering with his meditations. These were frequent, deep, and prolonged they bore upon a matter more important than five shillings. Distinctly more important and beyond all comparison more difficult to consider in all its aspects with philosophical serenity. Her object attained in astute secrecy. The heroic old woman had made a clean breast of it to Mrs. Verloc. Her soul was triumphant and her heart tremulous. Inwardly she quaked, because she dreaded and admired the calm, self-contained character of her daughter Winnie, whose displeasure was made redoubtable by a diversity of dreadful silences. But she did not allow her inward apprehensions to rob her of the advantage of venerable placidity conferred upon her outward person by her triple chin, the floating ampleness of her ancient form, and the impotent condition of her legs. The shock of the information was so unexpected that Mrs. Verloc, against her usual practice when addressed, interrupted the domestic occupation she was engaged upon. It was the dusting of the furniture in the parlor behind the shop. She turned her head towards her mother. "'Whatever did you want to do that for?' she exclaimed, in scandalized astonishment. The shock must have been severe to make her depart from that distant and uninquiring acceptance of facts which was her force and her safeguard in life. Weren't you made comfortable enough here? She had lapsed into these inquiries, but next moment she saved the consistency of her conduct by resuming her dusting, while the old woman sat scared and dumb under her dingy white cap and lustreless dark wig. Winnie finished the chair and ran the duster along the mahogany at the back of the horsehair sofa on which Mr. Verloc loved to take his ease in hat and overcoat. She was intent on her work, but presently she permitted herself another question. How in the world did you manage it, mother? As not affecting the inwardness of things, which it was Mrs. Verloc's principle to ignore, this curiosity was excusable. It bore merely on the methods. The old woman welcomed it eagerly as bringing forward something that could be talked about with much sincerity. She favored her daughter by an exhaustive answer, full of names and enriched by side comments upon the ravages of time as observed in the alteration of human countenances. The names were principally the names of licensed victuallers, poor daddy's friends, my dear. She enlarged with special appreciation on the kindness and condescension of a large brewer, a baronet and an M.P., the chairman of the governors of the charity. She expressed herself thus warmly because she had been allowed to interview by appointment his private secretary, a very polite gentleman, all in black, with a gentle, sad voice, but so very, very thin and quiet. He was like a shadow, my dear. Winnie, prolonging her dusting operations till the tale was told to the end, walked out of the parlor into the kitchen down two steps in her usual manner, without the slightest comment. Shedding a few tears in sign of rejoicing at her daughter's mansuetude in this terrible affair, Mrs. Verloc's mother gave play to her astuteness in the direction of her furniture, because it was her own and sometimes she wished it hadn't been. Heroism is all very well, but there are circumstances when the disposal of a few tables and chairs, brass bedsteads and so on, may be big with remote and disastrous consequences. She required a few pieces herself, the foundation which, after many importunities, had gathered her to its charitable breast, giving nothing but bare planks and cheaply papered bricks to the objects of its solicitude. The delicacy guiding her choice to the least valuable and most dilapidated articles passed unacknowledged, because Winnie's philosophy consisted in not taking notice of the inside of facts she assumed that mother took what suited her best.
As to Mr. Verloc, his intense meditation like a sort of Chinese wall, isolated him completely from the phenomena of this world of vain effort and illusory appearances. Her selection made, the disposal of the rest became a perplexing question in a particular way. She was leaving it in Brett Street, of course. But she had two children. Winnie was provided for by her sensible union with that excellent husband, Mr. Verloc. Stevie was destitute and a little peculiar. His position had to be considered before the claims of legal justice and even the promptings of partiality. The possession of the furniture would not be in any sense a provision. He ought to have it the poor boy, but to give it to him would be like tampering with his position of complete dependence. It was a sort of claim which she feared to weaken. Moreover, the susceptibilities of Mr. Verloc would perhaps not brook being beholden to his brother-in-law for the chairs he sat on. In a long experience of gentlemen lodgers, Mrs. Verloc's mother had acquired a dismal but resigned notion of the fantastic side of human nature. What if Mr. Verloc suddenly took it into his head to tell Stevie to take his blessed stick somewhere out of that? A division, on the other hand, however carefully made, might give some cause of offense to Winnie. No, Stevie must remain destitute and dependent, and at the moment of leaving Brett Street she had said to her daughter no use waiting till I am dead is there. Everything I leave here is altogether your own now, my dear. Winnie, with her hat on, silent behind her mother's back, went on arranging the collar of the old woman's cloak. She got her handbag, an umbrella, with an impassive face. The time had come for the expenditure of the sum of three and sixpence on what might well be supposed the last cab drive of Mrs. Verloc's mother's life. They went out at the shop door. The conveyance awaiting them would have illustrated the proverb that truth can be more cruel than caricature if such a proverb existed. Crawling behind an infirm horse, a metropolitan hackney carriage drew up on wobbly wheels and with a maimed driver on the box. This last peculiarity caused some embarrassment. Catching sight of a hooked iron contrivance protruding from the left sleeve of the man's coat, Mrs. Verloc's mother lost suddenly the heroic courage of these days. She really couldn't trust herself. What do you think, Winnie, she hung back. The passionate expostulations of the big-faced cabman seemed to be squeezed out of a blocked throat. Leaning over from his box, he whispered with mysterious indignation. What was the matter now? Was it possible to treat a man so? His enormous and unwashed countenance flamed red in the muddy stretch of the street. Was it likely they would have given him a license? He inquired desperately if... The police constable of the locality quieted him by a friendly glance, then addressing himself to the two women without marked consideration, said, He's been driving a cab for twenty years. I never knew him to have an accident. Accident shouted the driver in a scornful whisper. The policeman's testimony settled it. The modest assemblage of seven people, mostly underage, dispersed. Winnie followed her mother into the cab. Stevie climbed on the box. His vacant mouth and distressed eyes depicted the state of his mind in regard to the transactions which were taking place. In the narrow streets the progress of the journey was made sensible to those within by the near fronts of the houses gliding past slowly and shakily, with a great rattle and jingling of glass, as if about to collapse behind the cab and the infirm horse, with the harness hung over his sharp backbone flapping very loose about his thighs, appeared to be dancing mincingly on his toes with infinite patience. Later on, in the wider space of Whitehall, all visual evidences of motion became imperceptible. The rattle and jingle of glass went on indefinitely in front of the long treasury building and time itself seemed to stand still. At last Winnie observed this isn't a very good horse. Her eyes gleamed in the shadow of the cab straight ahead, immovable. On the box, Stevie shut his vacant mouth first, in order to ejaculate earnestly don't. The driver, holding high the reins twisted around the hook, took no notice. Perhaps he had not heard. Stevie's breast heaved. Don't whip. The man turned slowly his bloated and sodden face of many colors bristling with white hairs. His little red eyes glistened with moisture. His big lips had a violet tint. They remained closed. With the dirty back of his whip hand he rubbed the stubble sprouting on his enormous chin. You mustn't stammer it out Stevie violently, 
It hurts. Mustn't whip queried the other in a thoughtful whisper, and immediately whipped. He did this, not because his soul was cruel and his heart evil, but because he had to earn his fare. And for a time the walls of St. Stephen's, with its towers and pinnacles, contemplated in immobility and silence a cab that jingled. It rolled too, however. But on the bridge there was a commotion. Stevie suddenly proceeded to get down from the box. There were shouts on the pavement, people ran forward, the driver pulled up, whispering curses of indignation and astonishment. Winnie lowered the window and put her head out, white as a ghost. In the depths of the cab her mother was exclaiming, in tones of anguish, is that boy hurt? Is that boy hurt? Stevie was not hurt, he had not even fallen, but excitement as usual had robbed him of the power of connected speech. He could do no more than stammer at the window. Too heavy. Too heavy Winnie put out her hand onto his shoulder. Stevie. Get up on the box directly and don't try to get down again. No, no, walk. Must walk. In trying to state the nature of that necessity he stammered himself into utter incoherence. No physical impossibility stood in the way of his whim. Stevie could have managed easily to keep pace with the infirm, dancing horse without getting out of breath. But his sister withheld her consent decisively. The idea. Whoever heard of such a thing? Run after a cab her mother, frightened and helpless in the depths of the conveyance, entreated, Oh, don't let him, Winnie. He'll get lost. Don't let him. Certainly not. What next? Mr. Verloc will be sorry to hear of this nonsense, Stevie, I can tell you. He won't be happy at all. The idea of Mr. Verloc's grief and unhappiness acting as usual powerfully upon Stevie's fundamentally docile disposition, he abandoned all resistance and climbed up again on the box with a face of despair. The cabbie turned at him his enormous and inflamed countenance truculently. Don't you go for trying this silly game again, young fellow. After delivering himself thus in a stern whisper, strained almost to extinction, he drove on, ruminating solemnly. To his mind the incident remained somewhat obscure. But his intellect, though it had lost its pristine vivacity in the benumbing years of sedentary exposure to the weather, lacked not independence or sanity. Gravely he dismissed the hypothesis of Stevie being a drunken young nipper. Inside the cab the spell of silence, in which the two women had endured shoulder to shoulder the jolting, rattling and jingling of the journey, had been broken by Stevie's outbreak. Winnie raised her voice. You've done what you wanted, mother. You'll have only yourself to thank for it if you aren't happy afterwards. And I don't think you'll be. That I don't. Weren't you comfortable enough in the house? Whatever people think of us, you throwing yourself like this on a charity. My dear screamed the old woman earnestly above the noise, you've been the best of daughters to me. As to Mr. Verloc there. Words failing her on the subject of Mr. Verloc's excellence, she turned her old tearful eyes to the roof of the cab. Then she averted her head on the pretense of looking out of the window, as if to judge of their progress. It was insignificant and went on close to the curbstone. Night, the early dirty night, the sinister, noisy, hopeless and rowdy night of South London, had overtaken her on her last cab drive. In the gaslight of the low-fronted shops her big cheeks glowed with an orange hue under a black and mauve bonnet. Mrs. Verloc's mother's complexion had become yellow by the effect of age and from a natural predisposition to biliousness favored by the trials of a difficult and worried existence, first as wife, then as widow. It was a complexion that under the influence of a blush would take on an orange tint, and this woman, modest indeed but hardened in the fires of adversity, of an age, moreover, when blushes are not expected, had positively blushed before her daughter. In the privacy of a four-wheeler, on her way to a charity cottage one of a row which by the exiguity of its dimensions and the simplicity of its accommodation might well have been devised in kindness as a place of training for the still more straitened circumstances of the grave, she was forced to hide from her own child a blush of remorse and shame. Whatever people will think. She knew very well what they did think, the people Winnie had in her mind the old friends of her husband, and others too, 
whose interest she had solicited with such flattering success. She had not known before what a good beggar she could be, but she guessed very well what inference was drawn from her application, on account of that shrinking delicacy which exists side by side with aggressive brutality and masculine nature, the inquiries into her circumstances had not been pushed very far. She had checked them by a visible compression of the lips and some display of an emotion determined to be eloquently silent. And the men would become suddenly incurious, after the manner of their kind. She congratulated herself more than once on having nothing to do with women, who being naturally more callous and avid of details, would have been anxious to be exactly informed by what sort of unkind conduct her daughter and son-in-law had driven her to that sad extremity. It was only before the secretary of the great brewer MP and chairman of the charity, who acting for his principal, felt bound to be conscientiously inquisitive as to the real circumstances of the applicant, that she had burst into tears outright and aloud, as a cornered woman will weep. The thin and polite gentleman, after contemplating her with an air of being struck all of a heap abandoned his position under the cover of soothing remarks, she must not distress herself. The deed of the charity did not absolutely specify childless widows. In fact, it did not by any means disqualify her. But the discretion of the committee must be an informed discretion. One could understand very well her unwillingness to be a burden, etc., etc., upon to his profound disappointment, Mrs. Verloc's mother wept some more with an augmented vehemence. The tears of that large female in a dark, dusty wig and ancient silk dress festooned with dingy white cotton lace were the tears of genuine distress. She had wept because she was heroic and unscrupulous and full of love for both her children. Girls frequently get sacrificed to the welfare of the boys. In this case she was sacrificing Winnie. By the suppression of truth she was slandering her. Of course Winnie was independent, and need not care for the opinion of people that she would never see, and who would never see her whereas poor Stevie had nothing in the world he could call his own except his mother's heroism and unscrupulousness. The first sense of security following on Winnie's marriage wore off in time for nothing lasts, and Mrs. Verloc's mother, in the seclusion of the back bedroom, had recalled the teaching of that experience which the world impresses upon a widowed woman. But she had recalled it without vain bitterness her store of resignation amounted almost to dignity. She reflected stoically that everything decays wears out in this world that the way of kindness should be made easy to the well-disposed that her daughter Winnie was a most devoted sister, and a very self-confident wife indeed. As regards Winnie's sisterly devotion, her stoicism flinched. She accepted that sentiment from the rule of decay affecting all things human and some things divine. She could not help it not to do so would have frightened her too much. But in considering the conditions of her daughter's married state, she rejected firmly all flattering illusions. She took the cold and reasonable view that the less strain put on Mr. Verloc's kindness the longer its effects were likely to last. That excellent man loved his wife, of course, but he would, no doubt, prefer to keep as few of her relations as was consistent with the proper display of that sentiment. It would be better if its whole effect were concentrated on poor Stevie. And the heroic old woman resolved on going away from her children as an act of devotion and as a move of deep policy. The virtue of this policy consisted in this Mrs. Verloc's mother was subtle in her way, that Stevie's moral claim would be strengthened. The poor boy a good, useful boy, if a little peculiar had not a sufficient standing. He had been taken over with his mother, somewhat in the same way as the furniture of the Belgravian mansion had been taken over, as if on the ground of belonging to her exclusively. What will happen, she asked herself for Mrs. Verloc's mother was in a measure imaginative, when I die? And when she asked herself that question it was with dread. It was also terrible to think that she would not then have the means of knowing what happened to the poor boy. But by making him over to his sister by going thus away, she gave him the advantage of a directly dependent position. This was the more subtle sanction of Mrs. Verloc's mother's heroism and unscrupulousness. Her act of abandonment was really an arrangement for settling her son permanently in life. Other people made material sacrifices for such an object, she in that way. It was the only way. Moreover, she would be able to see how it worked. Ill or well, she would avoid the horrible incertitude on the deathbed. 
but it was hard, hard, cruelly hard. The cab rattled, jingled, jolted in fact, the last was quite extraordinary. By its disproportionate violence and magnitude it obliterated every sensation of onward movement and the effect was of being shaken in a stationary apparatus like a medieval device for the punishment of crime, or some very newfangled invention for the cure of a sluggish liver. It was extremely distressing, and the raising of Mrs. Verloc's mother's voice sounded like a wail of pain. I know, my dear, you'll come to see me as often as you can spare the time. Won't you? Of course answered Winnie shortly, staring straight before her. And the cab jolted in front of a steamy, greasy shop in a blaze of gas and in the smell of fried fish. The old woman raised a wail again. And, my dear, I must see that poor boy every Sunday. He won't mind spending the day with his old mother. Winnie screamed out stolidly. Mind. I should think not. That poor boy will miss you something cruel. I wish you had thought a little of that, mother. Not think of it. The heroic woman swallowed a playful and inconvenient object like a billiard ball, which had tried to jump out of her throat. Winnie sat mute for a while, pouting at the front of the cab, then snapped out, which was an unusual tone with her. I expect I'll have a job with him at first, he'll be that restless. Whatever you do, don't let him worry your husband, my dear. Thus they discussed on familiar lines the bearings of a new situation, and the cab jolted. Mrs. Verloc's mother expressed some misgivings. Could Stevie be trusted to come all that way alone? Winnie maintained that he was much less absent-minded now. They agreed as to that, it could not be denied. Much less hardly at all, they shouted at each other in the jingle with comparative cheerfulness. But suddenly the maternal anxiety broke out afresh. There were two omnibuses to take, and a short walk between. It was too difficult. The old woman gave way to grief and consternation. Winnie stared forward. Don't you upset yourself like this, mother. You must see him, of course. No, my dear. I'll try not to. She mopped her streaming eyes. But you can't spare the time to come with him and if he should forget himself and lose his way, and somebody spoke to him sharply, his name and address may slip his memory, and he'll remain lost for days and days. The vision of a workhouse infirmary for poor Stevie, if only during inquiries, wrung her heart, for she was a proud woman. Winnie's stare had grown hard, intent, inventive. I can't bring him to you myself every week, she cried. But don't you worry, mother. I'll see to it that he don't get lost for long. They felt a peculiar bump of vision of brick pillars lingered before the rattling windows of the cab a sudden cessation of atrocious jolting and uproarious jingling dazed the two women. What had happened? They sat motionless and scared in the profound stillness, till the door came open, and a rough, strained whispering was heard. Here you are. A range of gabled little houses, each with one dim yellow window, on the ground floor, surrounded the dark open space of a grass plot planted with shrubs and railed off from the patchwork of lights and shadows in the wide road, resounding with the dull rumble of traffic. Before the door of one of these tiny houses one without a light in the little downstairs window the cab had come to a standstill. Mrs. Verloc's mother got out first, backwards, with a key in her hand. Winnie lingered on the flagstone path to pay the cabman. Stevie, after helping to carry inside a lot of small parcels, came out and stood under the light of a gas lamp belonging to the charity. The cabman looked at the pieces of silver, which appearing very minute in his big, grimy palm symbolized the insignificant results which reward the ambitious courage and toil of a mankind whose day is short on this earth of evil. He had been paid decently for one shilling pieces and he contemplated them in perfect stillness as if they had been the surprising terms of a melancholy problem. The slow transfer of that treasure to an inner pocket demanded much laborious groping in the depths of decayed clothing. His form was squat and without flexibility. Stevie slender, his shoulders a little up, and his hands thrust deep in the side pockets of his warm overcoat, stood at the edge of the path, pouting. The cabman, pausing in his deliberate movements, seemed struck by some misty recollection. Oh, 
Here you are, young fellow, he whispered. You'll know him again, won't you? Stevie was staring at the horse, whose hindquarters appeared unduly elevated by the effect of emaciation. The little stiff tail seemed to have been fitted in for a heartless joke, and at the other end the thin, flat neck, like a plank covered with old horse hide, drooped to the ground under the weight of an enormous bony head. The ears hung at different angles, negligently and the macabre figure of that mute dweller on the earth steamed straight up from ribs and backbone in the muggy stillness of the air. The cabman struck lightly Stevie's breast with the iron hook protruding from a ragged, greasy sleeve. Look air, young feller. How'd you like to sit behind this OSS up to two o'clock in the morning P-Raps? Stevie looked vacantly into the fierce little eyes with red-edged lids. He ain't lame pursued the other, whispering with energy. He ain't got no sore places on on. Here he is. How would you like? His strained, extinct voice invested his utterance with a character of vehement secrecy. Stevie's vacant gaze was changing slowly into dread. You may well look. Till three and four o'clock in the morning. Cold and hungry, looking for fares. Drunks. His jovial purple cheeks bristled with white hairs and like Virgil's Silenus, who, his face smeared with the juice of berries, discoursed of Olympian gods to the innocent shepherds of Sicily. He talked to Stevie of domestic matters and the affairs of men whose sufferings are great and immortality by no means assured. I am a night cabbie, I am, he whispered, with a sort of boastful exasperation. I've got to take out what they will blooming well give me at the yard. I've got my missus and four kids at home. The monstrous nature of that declaration of paternity seemed to strike the world dumb. A silence reigned during which the flanks of the old horse, the steed of apocalyptic misery, smoked upwards in the light of the charitable gas lamp. The cabman grunted, then added in his mysterious whisper, This ain't an easy world Stevie's face had been twitching for some time, and at last his feelings burst out in their usual concise form. Bad. Bad. His gaze remained fixed on the ribs of the horse, self-conscious and sombre, as though he were afraid to look about him at the badness of the world. And his slenderness, his rosy lips and pale, clear complexion, gave him the aspect of a delicate boy, notwithstanding the fluffy growth of golden hair on his cheeks. He pouted in a scared way like a child. The cabman, short and broad, eyed him with his fierce little eyes that seemed to smart in a clear and corroding liquid. Hard on osses, but damn sight arter on poor chaps like me he wheezed just audibly. Poor. Poor stammered out Stevie, pushing his hands deeper into his pockets with convulsive sympathy. He could say nothing for the tenderness to all pain and all misery, the desire to make the horse happy and the cabman happy, had reached the point of a bizarre longing to take them to bed with him, and that, he knew, was impossible. For Stevie was not mad. It was, as it were, a symbolic longing and at the same time it was very distinct, because springing from experience, the mother of wisdom. Thus when as a child he cowered in a dark corner scared, wretched, sore, and miserable with the black, black misery of the soul, his sister Winnie used to come along and carry him off to bed with her, as into a heaven of consoling peace. Stevie, though apt to forget mere facts, such as his name and address for instance, had a faithful memory of sensations. To be taken into a bed of compassion was the supreme remedy, with the only one disadvantage of being difficult of application on a large scale. And looking at the cabman, Stevie perceived this clearly, because he was reasonable. The cabman went on with his leisurely preparations as if Stevie had not existed. He made as if to hoist himself on the box, but at the last moment from some obscure motive, perhaps merely from disgust with carriage exercise, desisted. He approached instead the motionless partner of his labors, and stooping to seize the bridle, lifted up the big, weary head to the height of his shoulder with one effort of his right arm, like a feat of strength. Come on, he whispered secretly. Limping, he led the cab away. There was an air of austerity in this departure, the scrunched gravel of the drive crying out under the slowly turning wheels, 
the horse's lean thighs moving with ascetic deliberation away from the light into the obscurity of the open space bordered dimly by the pointed roofs and the feebly shining windows of the little alms houses. The plaint of the gravel traveled slowly all round the drive. Between the lamps of the charitable gateway the slow corteg reappeared, lighted up for a moment, the short, thick man limping busily, with the horse's head held aloft in his fist, the lank animal walking in stiff and forlorn dignity, the dark, d low box on wheels rolling behind comically with an air of waddling. They turned to the left. There was a pub down the street, within fifty yards of the gate. Stevie left alone beside the private lamp post of the charity, his hands thrust deep into his pockets, glared with vacant sulkiness. At the bottom of his pockets his incapable weak hands were clenched hard into a pair of angry fists. In the face of anything which affected directly or indirectly his morbid dread of pain, Stevie ended by turning vicious. A magnanimous indignation swelled his frail chest to bursting and caused his candid eyes to squint. Supremely wise in knowing his own powerlessness, Stevie was not wise enough to restrain his passions. The tenderness of his universal charity had two phases as indissolubly joined and connected as the reverse and obverse sides of a medal. The anguish of immoderate compassion was succeeded by the pain of an innocent but pitiless rage. Those two states expressing themselves outwardly by the same signs of futile bodily agitation, his sister Winnie soothed his excitement without ever fathoming its twofold character. Mrs. Verloc wasted no portion of this transient life in seeking for fundamental information. This is a sort of economy having all the appearances and some of the advantages of prudence. Obviously it may be good for one not to know too much. And such a view accords very well with constitutional indolence. On that evening on which it may be said that Mrs. Verloc's mother having parted for good from her children had also departed this life, Winnie Verloc did not investigate her brother's psychology. The poor boy was excited, of course. After once more assuring the old woman on the threshold that she would know how to guard against the risk of Stevie losing himself for very long on his pilgrimages of filial piety, she took her brother's arm to walk away. Stevie did not even mutter to himself, but with the special sense of sisterly devotion developed in her earliest infancy, she felt that the boy was very much excited indeed. Holding tight to his arm, under the appearance of leaning on it, she thought of some words suitable to the occasion. Now, Stevie, you must look well after me at the crossings and get first into the bus, like a good brother. This appeal to manly protection was received by Stevie with his usual docility. It flattered him. He raised his head and threw out his chest. Don't be nervous, Winnie. Mustn't be nervous. Bus all right, he answered in a brusque slurring stammer partaking of the timorousness of a child and the resolution of a man. He advanced fearlessly with the woman on his arm, but his lower lip dropped. Nevertheless, on the pavement of the squalid and wide thoroughfare, whose poverty and all the amenities of life stood foolishly exposed by a mad profusion of gaslights, their resemblance to each other was so pronounced as to strike the casual passers-by. Before the doors of the public house at the corner, where the profusion of gaslight reached the height of positive wickedness, a four-wheeled cab standing by the curbstone with no one on the box seemed cast out into the gutter on account of irremediable decay. Mrs. Verloc recognized the conveyance. Its aspect was so profoundly lamentable, with such a perfection of grotesque misery and weirdness of macabre detail, as if it were the cab of death itself, that Mrs. Verloc, with that ready compassion of a woman for a horse when she is not sitting behind him, exclaimed vaguely. Poor brute. Hanging back suddenly, Stevie inflicted an arresting jerk upon his sister. Poor. Poor, he ejaculated appreciatively. Cabman poor too. He told me himself. The contemplation of the infirm and lonely steed overcame him. Jostled but obstinate, he would remain there, trying to express the view newly opened to his sympathies of the human and equine misery in close association. But it was very difficult. Poor brute, poor people was all he could repeat. It did not seem forcible enough, and he came to a stop with an angry splutter shame Stevie was no master of phrases, and perhaps for that very reason his thoughts lacked clearness and precision. 
but he felt with greater completeness and some profundity. That little word contained all his sense of indignation and horror at one sort of wretchedness having to feed upon the anguish of the other at the poor cabman beating the poor horse in the name, as it were, of his poor kids at home. And Stevie knew what it was to be beaten. He knew it from experience. It was a bad world. Bad. Bad. Mrs. Verloc, his only sister, guardian, and protector, could not pretend to such depths of insight. Moreover, she had not experienced the magic of the cabman's eloquence. She was in the dark as to the inwardness of the word shame. And she said placidly, Come along, Stevie. You can't help that. The docile Stevie went along, but now he went along without pride, shamblingly, and muttering half-words, and even words that would have been whole if they had not been made up of halves that did not belong to each other. It was as though he had been trying to fit all the words he could remember to his sentiments in order to get some sort of corresponding idea, and, as a matter of fact, he got it at last. He hung back to utter it at once. Bad world for poor people. Directly he had expressed that thought he became aware that it was familiar to him already in all its consequences. This circumstance strengthened his conviction immensely, but also augmented his indignation. Somebody, he felt, ought to be punished for it punished with great severity. Being no septic, but a moral creature, he was in a manner at the mercy of his righteous passions. Beastly, he added concisely. It was clear to Mrs. Verloc that he was greatly excited. Nobody can help that, she said. Do come along. Is that the way you're taking care of me? Stevie mended his pace obediently. He prided himself on being a good brother. His morality, which was very complete, demanded that from him. Yet he was pained at the information imparted by his sister Winnie who was good. Nobody could help that. He came along gloomily, but presently he brightened up. Like the rest of mankind perplexed by the mystery of the universe, he had his moments of consoling trust in the organized powers of the earth. The lease he suggested confidently. The police aren't for that observed Mrs. Verloc cursorily, hurrying on her way. Stevie's face lengthened considerably. He was thinking. The more intense his thinking, the slacker was the droop of his lower jaw. And it was with an aspect of hopeless vacancy that he gave up his intellectual enterprise. Not for that he mumbled, resigned, but surprised. Not for that he had formed for himself an ideal conception of the Metropolitan Police as a sort of benevolent institution for the suppression of evil. The notion of benevolence especially was very closely associated with his sense of the power of the men in blue. He had liked all police constables tenderly, with a guileless trustfulness, and he was pained. He was irritated, too, by a suspicion of duplicity in the members of the force, for Stevie was frank and as open as the day himself. What did they mean by pretending then? Unlike his sister who put her trust in face values, he wished to go to the bottom of the matter. He carried on his inquiry by means of an angry challenge. What for are they then when, what are they for, tell me? Winnie disliked controversy, but fearing most a fit of black depression consequent on Stevie missing his mother very much at first, she did not altogether decline the discussion. Guiltless of all irony, she answered yet in a form which was not perhaps unnatural in the wife of Mr. Verloc, delegate of the Central Red Committee, personal friend of certain anarchists, and a votary of social revolution. Don't you know what the police are for, Stevie? They are there so that them as have nothing shouldn't take anything away from them who have. She avoided using the verb to steal because it always made her brother uncomfortable, for Stevie was delicately honest. Certain simple principles had been instilled into him so anxiously on account of his queerness that the mere names of certain transgressions filled him with horror. He had been always easily impressed by speeches. He was impressed and startled now, and his intelligence was very alert. What he asked at once anxiously. Not even if they were hungry? Mustn't they? The two had paused in their walk. Not if they were ever so said Mrs. Verloc, with the equanimity of a person untroubled by the problem of the distribution of wealth and exploring the perspective of the roadway for an omnibus of the right color. Certainly not. 
But what's the use of talking about all that? You aren't ever hungry. She cast a swift glance at the boy, like a young man, by her side. She saw him amiable, attractive, affectionate, and only a little, a very little, peculiar. And she could not see him otherwise, for he was connected with what there was of the salt of passion in her tasteless life, the passion of indignation, of courage, of pity, and even of self-sacrifice. She did not add, and you aren't likely ever to be as long as I live. But she might very well have done so since she had taken effectual steps to that end. Mr. Verloc was a very good husband. It was her honest impression that nobody could help liking the boy. She cried out suddenly. Quick, Stevie. Stop that green bus. And Stevie, tremulous and important with his sister Winnie on his arm, flung up the other high above his head at the approaching bus, with complete success. An hour afterwards Mr. Verloc raised his eyes from a newspaper he was reading, or at any rate looking at, behind the counter, and in the expiring clatter of the doorbell beheld Winnie, his wife, enter and cross the shop on her way upstairs, followed by Stevie, his brother-in-law. The sight of his wife was agreeable to Mr. Verloc. It was his idiosyncrasy. The figure of his brother-in-law remained imperceptible to him because of the morose thoughtfulness that lately had fallen like a veil between Mr. Verloc and the appearances of the world of senses. He looked after his wife fixedly, without a word, as though she had been a phantom. His voice for home use was husky and placid, but now it was heard not at all. It was not heard at supper, to which he was called by his wife in the usual brief manner Adolf. He sat down to consume it without conviction, wearing his hat pushed far back on his head. It was not devotion to an outdoor life, but the frequentation of foreign cafés which was responsible for that habit, investing with the character of unceremonious impermanency Mr. Verloc's steady fidelity to his own fireside. Twice at the clatter of the cracked bell he arose without a word, disappeared into the shop, and came back silently. During these absences Mrs. Verloc, becoming acutely aware of the vacant place at her right hand, missed her mother very much, and stared stonily while Stevie, from the same reason, kept on shuffling his feet, as though the floor under the table were uncomfortably hot. When Mr. Verloc returned to sit in his place, like the very embodiment of silence, the character of Mrs. Verloc's stare underwent a subtle change, and Stevie ceased to fidget with his feet, because of his great and awed regard for his sister's husband. He directed at him glances of respectful compassion. Mr. Verloc was sorry, his sister Winnie had impressed upon him in the omnibus that Mr. Verloc would be found at home in a state of sorrow and must not be worried. His father's anger, the irritability of gentlemen lodgers, and Mr. Verloc's predisposition to immoderate grief had been the main sanctions of Stevie's self-restraint. Of these sentiments, all easily provoked, but not always easy to understand, the last had the greatest moral efficiency because Mr. Verloc was good. His mother and his sister had established that ethical fact on an unshakable foundation. They had established, erected, consecrated it behind Mr. Verloc's back, for reasons that had nothing to do with abstract morality, and Mr. Verloc was not aware of it. It is but bare justice to him to say that he had no notion of appearing good to Stevie. Yet so it was. He was even the only man so qualified in Stevie's knowledge because the gentlemen lodgers had been too transient and too remote to have anything very distinct about them but perhaps their boots and as regards the disciplinary measures of his father, the desolation of his mother and sister shrank from setting up a theory of goodness before the victim. It would have been too cruel, and it was even possible that Stevie would not have believed them. As far as Mr. Verloc was concerned, nothing could stand in the way of Stevie's belief. Mr. Verloc was obviously yet mysteriously good, and the grief of a good man is august. Stevie gave glances of reverential compassion to his brother-in-law. Mr. Verloc was sorry. The brother of Winnie had never before felt himself in such close communion with the mystery of that man's goodness. It was an understandable sorrow, and Stevie himself was sorry. He was very sorry, the same sort of sorrow and his attention being drawn to this unpleasant state, Stevie shuffled his feet. His feelings were habitually manifested by the agitation of his limbs. Keep your feet quiet, dear said Mrs. Verloc, with authority and tenderness, then turning towards her husband in an indifferent voice 
the masterly achievement of instinctive tact, are you going out tonight? She asked. The mere suggestion seemed repugnant to Mr. Verloc. He shook his head moodily, and then sat still with downcast eyes, looking at the piece of cheese on his plate for a whole minute. At the end of that time he got up, and went out went right out in the clatter of the shop door bell. He acted thus inconsistently, not from any desire to make himself unpleasant, but because of an unconquerable restlessness. It was no earthly good going out. He could not find anywhere in London what he wanted, but he went out. He led a cortege of dismal thoughts along dark streets, through lighted streets, in and out of two flash bars, as if in a half-hearted attempt to make a night of it, and finally back again to his menaced home, where he sat down fatigued behind the counter, and they crowded urgently round him, like a pack of hungry black hounds. After locking up the house and putting out the gas he took them upstairs with him a dreadful escort for a man going to bed. His wife had preceded him some time before, and with her ample form defined vaguely under the counterpane, her head on the pillow, and a hand under the cheek offered to his distraction the view of early drowsiness arguing the possession of an equable soul. Her big eyes stared wide open, inert and dark against the snowy whiteness of the linen. She did not move. She had an equable soul. She felt profoundly that things do not stand much looking into. She made her force and her wisdom of that instinct. But the taciturnity of Mr. Verloc had been lying heavily upon her for a good many days. It was, as a matter of fact, affecting her nerves. Recumbent and motionless, she said placidly. You'll catch cold walking about in your socks like this. This speech, becoming the solicitude of the wife and the prudence of the woman, took Mr. Verloc unawares. He had left his boots downstairs, but he had forgotten to put on his slippers, and he had been turning about the bedroom on noiseless pads like a bear in a cage. At the sound of his wife's voice he stopped and stared at her with a somnambulistic, expressionless gaze so long that Mrs. Verloc moved her limbs slightly under the bedclothes, but she did not move her black head sunk in the white pillow one hand under her cheek and the big, dark, unwinking eyes. Under her husband's expressionless stare, and remembering her mother's empty room across the landing, she felt an acute pang of loneliness. She had never been parted from her mother before. They had stood by each other. She felt that they had, and she said to herself that now mother was gone, gone for good. Mrs. Verloc had no illusions. Stevie remained, however, and she said, Mother's done what she wanted to do. There's no sense in it that I can see. I'm sure she couldn't have thought you had enough of her. It's perfectly wicked, leaving us like that. Mr. Verloc was not a well-read person his range of elusive phrases was limited, but there was a peculiar aptness in circumstances which made him think of rats leaving a doomed ship. He very nearly said so. He had grown suspicious and embittered. Could it be that the old woman had such an excellent nose? But the unreasonableness of such a suspicion was patent, and Mr. Verloc held his tongue. Not altogether, however. He muttered heavily. Perhaps it's just as well. He began to undress. Mrs. Verloc kept very still, perfectly still, with her eyes fixed in a dreamy, quiet stare, and her heart for the fraction of a second seemed to stand still too. That night she was not quite herself. As the saying is, and it was borne upon her with some force that a simple sentence may hold several diverse meanings mostly disagreeable. How was it just as well, and why? but she did not allow herself to fall into the idleness of barren speculation. She was rather confirmed in her belief that things did not stand being looked into. Practical and subtle in her way, she brought Stevie to the front without loss of time, because in her the singleness of purpose had the unerring nature and the force of an instinct. What I am going to do to cheer up that boy for the first few days I'm sure I don't know. He'll be worrying himself from morning till night before he gets used to mother being away. And he's such a good boy. I couldn't do without him. Mr. Verloc went on divesting himself of his clothing with the unnoticing inward concentration of a man undressing in the solitude of a vast and hopeless desert. For thus inhospitably did this fair earth, our common inheritance, present itself to the mental vision of Mr. Verloc. 
All was so still without and within that the lonely ticking of the clock on the landing stole into the room, as if for the sake of company. Mr. Verloc, getting into bed on his own side, remained prone and mute behind Mrs. Verloc's back. His thick arms rested abandoned on the outside of the counterpane like dropped weapons, like discarded tools. At that moment he was within a hair's breadth of making a clean breast of it all to his wife. The moment seemed propitious. Looking out of the corners of his eyes, he saw her ample shoulders draped in white, the back of her head, with the hair done for the night and three plaits tied up with black tapes at the ends, and he forbore. Mr. Verloc loved his wife as a wife should be loved, that is, maritally, with the regard one has for one's chief possession. This had arranged for the night, those ample shoulders, had an aspect of familiar sacredness, the sacredness of domestic peace. She moved not, massive and shapeless like a recumbent statue in the rough he remembered her wide-open eyes looking into the empty room. She was mysterious, with the mysteriousness of living beings. The far-famed secret agent Delta of the late Baron Stott Wartenheim's alarmist dispatches was not the man to break into such mysteries. He was easily intimidated. And he was also indolent, with the indolence which is so often the secret of good nature. He forbore touching that mystery out of love, timidity and indolence. There would be always time enough. For several minutes he bore his sufferings silently in the drowsy silence of the room, and then he disturbed it by a resolute declaration. I am going on the continent tomorrow. His wife might have fallen asleep already. He could not tell. As a matter of fact, Mrs. Verloc had heard him. Her eyes remained very wide open, and she lay very still, confirmed in her instinctive conviction that things don't bear looking into very much. And yet it was nothing very unusual for Mr. Verloc to take such a trip. He renewed his stock from Paris and Brussels. Often he went over to make his purchases personally. A little select connection of amateurs was forming around the shop in Brett Street, a secret connection eminently proper for any business undertaken by Mr. Verloc, who by a mystic accord of temperament and necessity, had been set apart to be a secret agent all his life. He waited for a while, then added, I'll be away a week or perhaps a fortnight. Get Mrs. Neal to come for the day. Mrs. Neal was the charwoman of Brett Street. Victim of her marriage with a debauched joiner, she was oppressed by the needs of many infant children. Red-armed and aproned in coarse sacking up to the armpits, she exhaled the anguish of the poor in a breath of soap suds and rum, in the uproar of scrubbing, in the clatter of tin pails. Mrs. Verloc, full of deep purpose, spoke in the tone of the shallowest indifference. There is no need to have the woman here all day. I shall do very well with Stevie. She let the lonely clock on the landing count off fifteen ticks into the abyss of eternity and asked, Shall I put the light out? Mr. Verloc snapped at his wife huskily. Put it out. 